asked him to, or I, I asked him to speak, and then we were talking about what, um, what we wanted, what he should speak on, and tetanus was one of the things that come up, came up. He has the website Doctor Within, um, which goes through all of these, and he's the author of this book, Vaccination is Not Immunization, which goes through um, the the real story that vaccination is not immunization or is not immunization building the immune system. So, thank you, Tim. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to San Francisco. Wow, that is really an echo, isn't it? Can everyone hear me okay? Doesn't it sound like I'm in a cave? Okay. It's like an Andreas Bolenweider video, right? So, welcome to San Francisco this afternoon, everyone. I just got off a plane at midnight. I just came from Europe. I was doing a series of these seminars there, so I'm very well rehearsed with this material. This is the new book, uh, Vaccination is Not Immunization. This is the, like the 15th edition of this book. Each edition is not a reprint. Each edition is a complete rewrite. So much has happened in the last two years since the last edition of this book that, um, it's not like reading the same book. So if you, if you read a book with one of these titles before, it will be completely different. Some of the new uh, material in this present book are, uh, some of the new material in this present book, rather, are supporting the idea, informing people of the idea that probably the most dangerous place to raise a child in the United States is California. And exact, that's not a hyperbole, that's not an exaggeration, that's, that, that's a fact because of our, our laws. Um, I'm summarizing an eight-hour lecture in, in this, but I'll, I'll just tell you, there's a chapter on my website that you should really read. Here's the web, that website, thedoctorwithin.com. Read this chapter. It's called The Four Horsemen of the Vaccine Apocalypse. And we talk about the four laws that uh, are passed in California. Two of them have already been passed. You know what they are. The other two coming are much worse, so we should be informed of that. The other unique feature of this book, as far as vaccines go, is that you cannot argue with me, really. This short little book of 200 pages, it's always 200 pages approximately, has over 300 references in the back. So every paragraph, in every paragraph that you read in this book, virtually every paragraph, you will see a number in brackets following a statistic or a fact. So it's, it's, it's bulletproof. And of the 300 references in the back of this book, how many of them do you think is a chiropractic or a new, new age or Berkeley Santa Cruz bong smoking tie dyed reference? None. They are all mainstream medicine, mainstream science, mainstream law, because that is where the opposition to today's vaccine policies is coming from, primarily. Okay, so those are just a few things contained here in your new textbook, so you'll have to look it over. I don't have time to do a summary. So now we're doing, ah, this is the website, thedoctorwithin.com. This is the retro homepage, right? So notable uh, buttons would be the chapters button. It's a pretty extensive list of monographs on a variety of topics, including uh, chiropractic, detoxification, nutrition, immunology, vaccines, sound healing, and things of that nature. Uh, the other one is newsletter archive. And uh, I, I've been doing newsletters for the last 10 years. They're archived monthly. So please sign up for that if you haven't already. And then the other major one is, oh yeah, feedback and testimonials. So there's a lot of people out there who have really um, are grateful for the information on this enormous website. I want to start out by saying that I am not anti-vaccine. So this is for all the CDC moles and spies who might be in the audience or the, or the, or the, the, the JSOC uh, assassins, all you guys. I am not anti-vaccine. I am in favor of any vaccine that has been proven safe, effective, and necessary 
by scientific research that is not funded wholly by the for-profit monolith. Yeah, there it is. It says it right there. <laughs> not anti-vax. Yeah. So today, people are trained to get their information very superficially. We want to get, we want to understand a concept that we hear about. We want to understand it immediately within 30 seconds. So we go to the most sophisticated uh, tool for the science of lying, Google, Wikipedia. These are really not as interacted and open-ended as you might think. They're, they are extremely well orchestrated, extremely well controlled. Uh, but that's, in order to get the truth of any matter, not just, not just this topic that we're talking about today, we have to spend more than 60 seconds looking at the information. We have to look a little deeper than 140 character sound bites in order to see, uh, the actual scientific truth of a subject that we're, we're trying to understand. So that, that's really the purpose of this book and the purpose of my full day lectures as well. To see what the, I'm interested in what do the guys who make the vaccines, what do they say? I'm not interested in the, in the sales arm. I'm not interested in what the pediatricians or the clinics say about vaccines. I want to know what do the people who make the vaccines say. And that's the information contained in this book. So, as far as tetanus is go, as, as far as tetanus is concerned, then uh, in this short presentation today, we will be looking at some common myths that we've all been taught ever since we were a little kid. The first myth is that tetanus is still a threat today. Well, actually, it is really not. Did you know that in in, the, in this country of 300 million people, there are less than 10 deaths per year at this time. Um, and most of, the, practically all of those deaths are come from people who have already been vaccinated, and they also come from people who are extremely immune-suppressed, sick, and drug addicts, and that kind of immune-suppressed situation. Second thing is that tetanus is caused by a bacterium. We've all, all been taught to believe that tetanus is caused by some bug that lurks on rusty nails and that if, if this bug establishes himself in your body then you're going to get tetanus and end up arched backward on a table with your jaw locked which has appeared in every physiology text for the last 50 years. That's not quite true either. We'll see in a minute why that's not true. And then we'll also see why tetanus cannot... No, we'll also see why tetanus vaccine cannot prevent tetanus. Now, I'm going to probably say this a, a couple times, but i got to say it once to make sure that I do. There is no such thing as a curative vaccine. Okay, so what's the theory? Uh, I, 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 I am out... Um, okay, the story, the story, story. I'm a horseman. My horse is Shiloh. So one day, I went up to see Shiloh. He was in his paddock, his little place, right? And it's raining that day. There's mud all over the place, mud all over the place. So Shiloh is eating his alfalfa. I'm doing what I'm usually doing, shoveling. I am shoveling in Shiloh's paddock, right? Now, there is a wooden post right here, and I slipped in the mud and caught myself on the wooden post at which there was a rusty nail stick sticking out, right? So I go like this. I look at my hand and I go, Okay, Mr. Vaccination is not immunization. Now what? <laughs> so the following sequence of thoughts went through my mind. So I'm thinking, okay, the first thing as I had is a picture of the dude arched backward on the table. I'd rather avoid that if possible. Second thing I thought was, okay, so now what's the theory? What's the dock in the box theory here? Okay, we have clostridium tetani, an anaerobic bacillus, which, uh, tends to reside in the ground and in what? Animal spores. Hmm, they seem to be in evidence in this paddock. That's not good, particularly. But 
The good news is this nail was four feet off the ground, so if I were going to get this disease from the bug, right, the bug would have to jump up four feet. The other good news is that it's anaerobic, right, so it has to survive without oxygen. If it's on the rusty nail, you know, that has oxygen, it can't survive there. So that's looking pretty good. But then the, the real thing that, that, that solved the equation for me was this realization. What are we taught in this situation? You know, your child is in the sandbox, nicks itself on something, and you rush it to dock in the box. Okay, I have just, okay, the theory is, the danger is, I have just injected myself with Clostridium tetani, which may cause tetanus, the disease, in me. So now, what is the, what is the dogma that we've all been trained to believe that we are going to go to dock in the box, and he is going to do what? give me another injection that is going to have a 100% chance of having Clostridium or its derivatives, and that's going to cure me. I don't think so. <laughs> so I look at my hand once more, and I go, no. I look at Shiloh, he goes, no. <laughs> and, th and that was it. It just, you know, I just forgot about it. So it's <laughs> the idea is there are no curative vaccines. All through history, since the time of Edward Jenner in 200 years, the best they can ever hope for vaccines, the best effect vaccines are ever claimed to have had is to, it, to trigger antibodies in you for some future memory of the, uh, an invasion from this particular antigen, and then it's going to neutralize him. It is absolutely impossible. It's in the realm of fantasy and superstition that once someone has already been infected or injected or the d disease uh, microbe is proliferating in that person's body, that more of that same microbe is going to cure him. That is superstition. That is, that is medieval superstition. So I, I, I probably will repeat this, but I want to make sure that I got those ideas said in this presentation. So remember the Shiloh story, if you can't remember anything else from today's presentation. Yeah. I already did the last one, even better. Okay. Okay, now, we're going to look at some, some real science here about tetanus. Now, most of this information is in your textbook, so you don't really have to write all this down. The most succinct, organized summary of the real science behind the tet tetanus vaccine was written by this absolute genius uh, several years ago. His name is Dr. Alec Burton. He was an osteopath and naturopath so many years ago, entitled Tetanus, One Naturopath's View. So you, you can, it, this will come right up. Okay, so that's the theory that, we, that is, is taught. That's the dogma. It's caused by an anaerobic bacillus, Clostridium tetani. And, but here's what Burton says. He says this, tetanus toxin fails to produce any recognizable pathological lesions in the tissues it affects, that's one problem, nor do any specific changes occur at the site of infection by this clostridium tetani. Okay, well that's interesting. The toxin from, the toxin from this bacillus does not produce any recognizable pathological lesions. How can it cause a disease if that's true? But that is true. And the other thing is, wouldn't you think if, if you were being infected by some, some, uh, some, some, some demonic microbe, uh, who effects some puncture wound in your body, that there would be some specific changes at the site of the puncture wound? But there, there aren't. All right? This is right from Cecil Loeb's textbook of medicine. You don't have to write these down, but you can. The other thing is, we must recognize that they pretend that, like, Clostridium only exists in your child's sandbox, or it only exists, you know, in Shiloh's paddock. It only exists in a very few locations in the world. That is not true. Clostridium tetani is a ubiquitous bacteria. It's, it's, if we, if, if we did cultures, very careful cultures on the skin and in the gut flora of everyone in this room, 
we, for certain, we would find it in at least 50% of the people in this room. It would never cause any harm or symptoms what, for, whatsoever. In the skin, in the tract, it's, it's, it's present in house dust in, in most people's house, even in people who clean their house, unlike me. It's, it's, avail it's, it's present there. The other thing is this. The disease of tetanus is practically non-existent in this country. There are, you know, we have 300 million people in this country, right? The, 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 there, there are less than 10 deaths per year in this country from tetanus. You know, and we're, we're talking about, there are some really immune suppressed and, and, uh, poor examples of the human species and people who are barely hanging on and barely surviving and some really poor living conditions, living conditions in this country. Well, take all that into effect and still only 10 people per year die from this. So it's not like there's an epidemic about to kill us all anytime soon. Okay. As far as epidemiology, the uh, mantra is that Doc in the Box and your doctor will, has always told you is that, what is it? Uh, tetanus vaccine has saved us from the scourge of disease. Uh, they use that for all, all the, all the, all the, all the diseases of childhood. The vaccine has saved us from the scourge of disease. Here is the best reference to dispel that fantasy available in every community library, every university library, every school library, anywhere. International Mortality Statistics by Michael Alderson. On page 163, this, this, this chart you will find. You don't have to write this down. This chart is in your book as well. So how you read this is, on the left hand, we got the year, right? Uh, we're just going to do tetanus because that's all what you, we're doing today, right? In 1901, there were over 28,000 deaths from tetanus in the United States, right? By the time the, t the DPT shot, that's the tetanus vaccine, right? By the time the DPT shot came out in the mid-40s, that was already down to 1,600. Uh, if you go on the CDC chart, uh, ch uh, site, you will see that it continued to go down from there, and now it's down to almost nothing. So they will, they will come and tell you the mantra, oh, the reason for that is that so many people are vaccinated. No, that's not true, because guess what percentage of the, the 10 people who do die from tetanus, get, guess what percentage of them were vaccinated? Like all of them. Okay, so that's not true. So it's not a threat. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Tetanus as a disease is not a threat. So... The other thing is, how did we go from this idea of, you know, you know, this, this, this bacteria lurking in the a rusty nail, and I'm out in some filthy work environment, and I cut my uh, hand, in a, or I sl do some slash, and I have to rush to Doc in the Box, wash it, and get the shot. How did it get from there to you're in your antiseptic confines of your little computer room at home, and you're stapling something together and you accidentally nick your freaking finger with a stapler and it bleeds one drop and your spouse tells you, oh dear, you better rush to the doctor and get your... Yeah, see, we're, we are programmed. We are programmed. Okay, continuing with this. Tetanus... No, no, no. no. This, is, this, is, this is a quote right out of some of the, the medical research that I'm going to cite in a second here. They say... Tetanus, quote, seems to be associated with clostridium, but what, what are still unknown, even to the present day, are, are these items, the mechanism of absorption. We don't know how clostridium is actually absorbed into the body and in cases where it causes the disease. We don't know exactly how it causes the disease. We don't know exactly if it causes the disease. And we, do, and we don't know for sure the specific cause of tetanus. The whole construct is merely theoretical and are, always has been. This is right out of, that. again, that is out of, of Cecil and Loeb's medical textbook. It's a textbook used commonly in medical schools. All right. Now, who's this handsome gentleman? Very good. And Pasteur, actually, you know, this is the guy 
who invented the germ theory. You know, he's the darling of the pharmaceutical industry, right? Uh, most human disease is caused by little bugs that will somehow waft their way from the, the cosmos into your body and cause some disease in you. And so it is the job of organized medicine to figure out what drug or potion we can give you to kill the bug in you without killing you. That's essentially the short version of the germ theory. And he was, the, you know, did you know this? Pasteur was not a doctor. He had no credentials in physiology. Did you know that? He was a chemist. Anyway, he, 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 uh, he gave, he supported, he invented the foundation for the entire, today's entire ph pharmaceutical industry. On his deathbed, when there were no more laurels to be garnered, no more money to make, no more awards to get, here's what he said. The germ is nothing, the terrain is everything. In other words, it's not the bug, it's the environment. We create our own diseases. We earn our own diseases. We earn our own diseases, including, most of the time, cancer. Okay, so I'm going to cite a couple of other ideas from the best medical reference about tetanus. Here's one from, from Bosanquet and Iyer. They're another standard medical reference, right? Quote, the bacilli are in pure, sorry, the bacilli are in pure culture incapable of vegetating in vivo. That means of multiplying in the body. So if you, if you take a culture of, if you take a culture of clostridium and put it in the body of a mammal or a human, you will not, they, they will not multiply. Here's something else. Tetanus bacilli have been found in 20% of war wounds, although no symptoms of tetanus were ever present. In 50% of cases of undoubted tetanus, the bacilli were not present. They were undiscoverable. And Clostridium tetani may be present in vast numbers of wounds without producing tetanus. Now, this, this is a huge uh, resource, very detailed Official history of the war, pathology, 1923, talking about very well document, very well documented medical records from the First World War. Uh, they continue. The cause of tetanus is a bacterium. Okay, so then, so then, this supposed uh, presumed cause of tetanus is a bacterium, which is a harmless and pure culture b incapable of multiplying in the body c absent in 50% of cases of undoubted tetanus which violates Coe's postulates okay for all, anybody in here who remembers what Coe's postulates are they are four axioms which must be met in order to prove that a certain microbe causes a certain disease right so we've gone through that with all the diseases that have been defined in Merck's manual, you know, up to the present time. But this is a violation of that right there. It's, if it, it has to be, Co said, it, the microbe must be present in every case. Remember that? For those of you who studied Co's postulate, here is a medical test stating that Clostridium is only present in 50% of cases. Okay, and D, the clostridium often remains in the body for months or years without producing symptoms. You see, that's like I said, if we actually cultured the skin and tract of everyone in this room, at least 50% of us would have clostridium. Oh, this is from Alec Burton himself, his conclusion. Okay. Now, before they invented the DPT vaccine in the 40s, before they invented the DPT vaccine in the 40s, okay, uh, they had some other concoctions that they sold as cures for tetanus. One of these was horse serum. So the serum, as many of you know, means the, 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 the part of the liquid part of the blood. We will draw the horse blood and we, we have a theory involving magic and incantations, I, I would imagine, that the liquid part of the horse blood will 
immunize you against tetanus. That, that was a theory before the 40s. Well, they used that for a long time, and they injected hundreds of thousands of people with that serum. And then they became disconcerted when too many people came up with death from anaphylaxis. And, yeah, and then they discovered... So they... So they replaced the horse serum idea with the new DPT, diphtheria pertussis tetanus vaccine. Now, does anybody know the, the really the classic text, you know, just ordinary everyday text is real, very well referenced uh, on DPT vaccine that was written in the 1980s. Very famous text called, wow, you guys are educated. People never know that. That's right. Shot in the Dark by Harris Coulter. Okay. Um, so he points out in that book, and, and, and there's many other sources, when we put together, that's diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus vaccine, when we put together that concoction back, back in those days, was there any evidence showing that the tetanus, part of that triple, co- triple shot cocktail, would cure or prevent tetanus? The, ab- the answer is no, none. There is absolutely none. I know I'm not talking about, I'm not, this is supposed to be about tetanus, but just as an aside here, the D that stands for diphtheria, you know, th- there, are, there have only been two cases for y- per year in the United States since like 1970 or anything. Uh, and there have only been approximately two cases or less every year since 1970. And three decades ago, they discovered that even in those few cases which did occur of diphtheria, it was completely responsive to one of the most common antibiotics, erythromycin. So why do we keep vaccinating every single kid? Now we are up to six doses of DPT vaccines. I mean, back in the 40s, for years, they only gave kids one dose the whole childhood. I mean, it was one time. That's right, one time. DPT, one time. And then it went up to two, went up to three, four, five. You know, so I have, I have this chart. Many of you have seen it. It's in your textbook as well. If you were a kid growing up, you know, like in the 50s, you got two vaccines. If you were a baby, a kid growing up in, a little kid growing up in the 80s, you got 20 vaccines in the U.S. If you were a kid growing up in the 90s, you got 40 vaccines. And then after 9-11, all bets were off, and it's been, you know, skyrocketing since then. And now, as you'll see in your textbook, a kid in the United States getting all his vaccines on shot day before he's 18 gets 69 vaccines. There is no country on Earth who does anything close to that. All right. So anyway, going back to, going back to tetanus, was there any evidence showing pres- Prevention of tetanus disease by adding this T to the DPT shot, that component of the vaccine, none whatsoever. So what were they relying on? It was like superstition. It was in the realm of religion. What's the definition of religion? Unquestioning acceptance of ideas of a designated authority. CDC, FDA. And, and... Belief with no physical evidence. That, I mean, you should memorize this phrase, write it down every time you're reading, uh, anything, any proclamations from the World Health Organization, National Institutes of Health, CDC, or FDA. We're talking about belief with no physical evidence. They are, they are addicted to expounding and spewing forth statements that have no basis in physical science. Okay, uh, and a history of enforcing those beliefs and the persecution of outsiders, anyone who does not believe them. Okay, so this is pretty self-evident. All right, now, this is from medical press. Failure of the tetanus vaccine. Quote, deaths from tetanus occur in 7% of civilian cases and 50% of military cases in spite of the use of the vaccine. So this is only like 
three years after the vaccine came into common use, and uh, they were using it on the soldiers in the Second World War. And, th and these uh, medical records in the, in, in, during wartime are very detailed and very well kept, actually. But this is, this is the results that they noticed from the early tetanus vaccine, which is essentially unchanged today. No proven value for the vaccine. Quote, it is disappointing to find that the case mortality is the same as in 19, in the First World War, there is still no convincing evidence. And this is a, a quote from Medical History of the Second World War. The book is called Medicine and Pathology. So it's amazing when you, when you research in the medical records of both the First World War and the Second World War, you will find the same, the exact same results for Resu uh, for the effect of vaccines treating any kind of imagined, supposed, presumed illnesses. Now, this would all be not quite so sinister if the vaccine were like a smoothie or Dr. Pepper or something like that. But it's not. It's not innocuous. It's noxious. <coughs> Here are some of the dangers of the tetanus vaccine, which the manufacturers admit in the PDR. Uh, early dangers include anaphylaxis, an extremely annoying side effect. <laughs> Unconsciousness and death also, just not on my party list. Late, and then the latent or later on, could be one year, could be two years, could be four years, could be 40 years. We don't really know. L delayed side effects, results of the tetanus vaccine, which include chills, fever, hives, edema, or any kind of degenerative disease, Guillain-Barre, Lou Gehrig's disease, all these degenerative neurological diseases of adults that are increasing in this country. At at a logarithmic rate, swollen lymph glands as well. Okay. So, Burton concludes now, the real cause of tetanus. What is the real cause of tetanus? He no longer has, he no longer is worshiping at the altar of Clostridium tetani. So, but nevertheless, tetanus is, is an actual disease. It does occur sometimes. But what's the real cause? Here it is. Not a germ, but a, but not a germ, <coughs> excuse me, not a germ, but dirt and filth. The bacteria are harmless when placed into a surgically clean wound. So they actually did this. They placed the bacteria in surgically clean wounds over and over. Tetanus develops when drainage of a wound is checked and dirt is retained in the tissues. When drainage is checked. So, you know who knows this? Rodeo clowns. Rodeo clowns. I used to ride with this girl. She was, her boyfriend was a rodeo clown, right? And, you know, these guys occasionally, they forget to, uh, they forget to dull up the, the bull's horns. You know, they're supposed to dull them up, cut off the points or something and they forgot or whatever. But anyway, these guys, these guys are insane in the first place, but they, they've all been, been, been gored at one time or another. But they all know when you get gored, you don't go to Doc in a Box. You, you leave it open, you flush it with horse liniment, and you go get drunk. That's the cure. You know, and, and they don't get, they don't get tetanus. Rodeo clowns never get tetanus. You know, they get concussions and other stuff. They're, and they're insane, but they don't get tetanus. So, I mean, so even mainstream medicine, even mainstream medicine knows today that you don't suture a puncture wound. And this is why. This is why. Because they, they even somehow at some level instinctively know that uh, wounds that are blocked t tend to fester and become petri dishes for any opportunistic infections, right? Now, the bacilli, this is Burton again, the bacilli do not circulate in the blood. They remain at the point of entry and produce toxins. 
So th- th- therefore, there, there again, we find a, a very a difficult question to answer. How could, how could these uh, bacilli cause, you know, systemic disease throughout the person's body enough to cause this arching on the table and lockjaw if they do not even circulate through the body? It's, it's mysterious. Okay, quote, it is to the host that we must look for causes. Here we will find the cause of tetanus, not in some microscopic piece of protoplasm which we endow with almost omnipotent properties. The bacteria may be a factor in tetanus, the toxin may be involved in some way, but that these are fundamental causes is nonsense. Otherwise, the disease would be more common. In view of the fact that the bacteria is so frequently found on and in our bodies. So that is Alec Burton. So if, if you're really interested in this, actually I, I summarized his, uh, his monograph more in your textbook or you can actually go and read the original. Um, this guy, have, what was the, you guys, does anybody know who, uh, Herbert Shelton was and the hygienist, the hygienist movement from back in the day? Yeah, well, he, he was the most modern proponent of these very evolved and advanced uh, thinkers in the field of human health and disease. Okay, now, now let, here's the Swiss company who, who has the patent on tetanus, the Swiss Sanofi Pasteur, they have the patent on te- tetanus. Here's what they say on their insert. That's that little paper written in microprint, comes in all the boxes, right? Oh, yeah, at the end. There's a section on, oh, there's a section on, says, carcinogenesis, mutagenesis, mutagenesis, impairment of fertility, quote, tetanus vaccine, tetanus vaccine has not been evaluated for carcinogenicity, mutagenic potential, or impairment of fertility. You know what? I, I have so many PDRs, you know, physician deaths reference, that big Bible looking thing that, that's the, all the drugs and vaccines from time immemorial every year are put in there. This sentence, this exact sentence is at the end of every single vaccine on the market, which means that the manufacturer is telling you we don't know for sure whether or not this vaccine will cause cancer in your child. As a consequence, guess what? According to the CDC, what is the number one fatal disease of children in the United States today? That's right, it's cancer. You know, I'm in rooms full of doctors all that time. I mean, I'm in, roo- I'm in rooms full of doctors asking that question all the time, and usually, it's silent when I ask that question. They don't know. That's right. The number one fatal disease of children, most, most common fatal disease of children today, according to the CDC, is cancer. Now, think about this for a second. Before 1960, cancer was unknown in children in the United States. There were no cases of cancer among children. Zero in the United States before 1960. Now we have gone from two vaccines to freaking 69 vaccines in a space of like 70 years. Now it's the, okay, and it's from, it's, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. We know that viruses from high school, we know that viruses have this, 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 this annoying talent of being able to splice themselves into the host DNA without killing the host, you know, and so, this idea of, uh, this idea of mutagenesis and changing and, and, and de- altering DNA is, is, is well recognized in mainstream science. In a clinical study conduct, uh, we're still, we're going back to the, uh, Sanofi Pasteur insert here now. In a clinical study conducted in Baltimore, infants received one of three lots of DT vaccine formulation that contained thimerosal uh, 0.5 milliliters at two months, four months, and six months. Those are the first three doses that we give to our babies. Two months, four months, and six months. Now it's like, think about it. 
This is how little confidence they have in their own vaccine. This is how little confidence they have in their own vaccine. If it really worked, would they really need to give, does it really wear off after two months? The other, the other tragic thing and just colossal systematic ignorance is that, you know, like I said, no child is born with an intact immune system. Babies do not have the ability, the enzymatic, the enzymatic ability to break down proteins, uh, foreign substances, any foreign substances for that matter, and, and, and we're giving the hepatitis B vaccine on the first day of life. So who's driving this bus? It doesn't make sense. Tabula rasa, that's a Latin word that means... That's right. And is that you? Yeah, of course. It means clean slate. Children are born clean slate. No, no, no immune system set up yet. During the first two years of life, their immune system is virtually struggling into the most rudimentary, rudimentary, uh, um, the most rudimentary condition. Yeah. Struggles into existence for the first two years. So, and that's if the child is unvaccinated. That's if the child's formative immune system is not handicapped with this huge array, this overwhelming array of experimental man-made laboratory creations. Did I mention that of the 69 vaccines mandated for American children, that guess how many of them are mandated before 18 months? Before 18 months, the answer is 36. Now I have to tell you, I do this lecture in countries all over the world. The majority of other countries in the world who vaccinate, um, their total number of vaccines recommended for all of childhood is about 36. We're giving that many to our children before they even have a chance to develop the most rudimentary immune system. Yes, I already said that. Okay. So very good. So this is this is a summary of the problems with the tetanus vaccine that I can think of off the top of my head in my one hour limit here. You can get other ideas from the references in your textbook and, and indeed from the section on tetanus, which is in your textbook, The War on Children. The other thing is this very uh, distressing, dismaying, is do you know that most of the time, if you do go into Doc in the Box, into the clinic for a tetanus shot, do you know that most of the time they give you a DPT shot? Because even though it exists, the separate tetanus vaccine is very rare. At the very least, they're giving you the DT combo, diphtheria tetanus, which you absolutely do not need. So this is where marketing eclipses science. This is, this is a phenomenon we see over and over and over in the day-to-day practicality administration of, of vaccines in, in, in this society. Marketing eclipses science. Okay, now I'm going to, uh, next month I'm going to be in Minneapolis for the Wise Traditions uh, seminar. They asked me to do something on autism detox protocol. So I want to just, just suggest a couple ideas from that because I know that many people, I mean, I think I can assume that Everyone in this room, if you don't have an autistic child or have a family member who has an autistic child, at least you know an autistic child and you have seen an autistic child. Can I fairly assume that that's fairly accurate with the majority in this room? So, you know, I have done a, a lot of research on autism. Many of it, much of it is in your textbook. More of it is in individual monographs under the chapter section of my website. So please, Look at that resource when you want to. But this, this, is, this is notable. <laughs> Autism came out of nowhere in the late 90s. You know, Before that, it was, it was 1 in 10,000. 
and gradually it increased, increased, increased. Today, today, CDC cops to one in 45. In many parts of the country, it actually must be higher than that. Uh, among the, the Somalis, I have a whole section on the Somalis, and it's, it, it's much higher than that, so you can read those statistics. But it's, it's perverse, I think, that at the same time, since the, uh, since the 90s, as autism has grown to this true epidemic where there are, we don't even know how many min millions, but it's at least six million that they'll admit to autistics and increasing. The, what has been the mantra of organized medicine, we don't know what's causing it. It's probably genetic. Uh, we refuse to spend one dime studying it, the cause of it, and we really don't know where it came from. But, oh, yes, by the way, we do know one thing, and that thing is there can be no... Association with Excellent. No possible connection with vaccines. We do, we do know that. So, so all these millions of parents over, over the past 25, 30 years... It's, it's curious, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's notable, it's notable to see the grassroots emergence of what I call the autism industry in, in which, you know, all, all these protocols for detoxification, uh, 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 have, have come into being. And the, the, the other mantra of, of organized medicine at the same time is there's no scientific evidence that mercury in vaccines causes autism. That's a rather famous mantra. No evidence that mercury causes autism. And yet, all the protocols of these grassroots programs that have come up in the past 30 years, have, most of them have focused on some method of chelating that thimerosal, that mercury, out of the person's brain. So we have developed a very simple and accessible protocol for autism, and I'll put this up against any of the high-profile ones, consisting of, there's a chapter on autism detox, right, on my website. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. The, the focus, the objectives of this particular autism detox protocol are twofold. Clear the track and clear the blood. Then, if the child is still Unbalanced, we'll talk about what else to do, but this works most of the time. Clear the tract and clear the blood. So to that end, we have an autism detox protocol, the first part of which is 60 days, right? You can, it consists of the most common sense diet. Now when you st start talking about diet and nutrition, it's kind of like talking about politics and religion. It's impossible not to an antagonize somebody, uh, so I really don't care. So I'm just going to tell you, that you already know, you already know this diet. It's just, you know, stop eating all the trash we're eating, you know. So it's like, I'm gonna do the diet in a second. Here's the whole program. It, it consists of the diet and seven supplements, uh, enzymes for clearing the blood, fluorobiotics for bringing the colon back to life, which all, all autistic children have a dead colon. Uh, Expel, which is a classical, uh, it's a, a detox, it's an herbal formula for colon detox. Antioxidants, which um, free radicals are going to be produced in any real program of detoxification. Minerals, we're all mineral deficient in this country today, so that was a no-brainer. Oral chelation, we must, this is specifically for heavy metals like aluminum and mercury. We must... Uh, they are not water-soluble. Enzymes will not flush those from the body. We must chelate them. You must learn what that word means. Most of you probably already do. Okay. And collagen, hydrolyzed collagen. We were talking about that today. So I've, Now, I have a whole chapter on each one of these, so I'm just going to give you a couple minutes on each one of these. But first, we're going to talk about the diet, which I think you already know. What I did was... I. What I did was I divided food into four categories. Unrestricted, some moderation, rarely, and not in this lifetime. Now, the 60-day 60, 60 program consists only of the top two categories. 
So for 60 days, okay, this is 18 months and older now for autistic kids. 18 months and older. For 60 days, the child will only eat raw fruits and vegetables or juices, their juices, you know, preferably the best you can get. Organic goes without saying, right? Now, the two liters, obviously, the little kids are not going to drink that much. That's the adult dose. But as much good water, we're not going to have that discussion now. Uh, selected nutritional herbs, you can have that discussion. Most of you might know what that means. Um, beans and rice combinations, organic, of course, and ground up very fine and thinned out so they're uh, palatable for the child. Okay, that was category one. Category two consists of this. You don't really have to write this down. This is on my website under New West Diet. So some moderation. Organic meats, raw dairy. Okay, raw dairy. You, know, you guys know what that means. I mean, we're so lucky. We're one of the six states in the United States where it is legal to sell raw dairy. Milk, cheese, butter, ice cream, yogurt, right? Of only, only the raw. All right. Uh, eggs are fine. In, in, you know, you can fix them for the little baby. You know how to do it. Uh, balsamic vinegar, maybe not. This is more for an adult. Uh, grilled or raw fish. That's critical for the introduce fish into the child's life as soon as possible because, you know, 70% of the newborn, 70% of the, the, the newborn's energy of his whole body goes to building the central nervous system. So EFAs are an incredibly important uh, nutrition source. Clean soups, that means they didn't come in a can, you made them from scratch. And whole grains, whole grains. So we can have that discussion later on. Okay, here's the food. Okay, first of all, I'm going to shorten this by saying, here's the three foods that the child cannot have. Uh, refined carbohydrates. That's white sugar, white flour. So you have to know everything. You have to know everything. You have to read all the labels, know what's in everything. No refined carbohydrates. Number two, no pasteurized dairy. No pasteurized dairy. No milk, cheese, butter, ice cream, yogurt, if it's pasteurized. Number three, no hydrogenated oils, which is like in everything, all packaged processed foods. So you have to know how they say that on the labels. You have to read all the labels in everything. So I think... This is not too far-fetched for most of the people in this room are very educated. And then here's the things that they cannot eat. Uh, do I have um, do I have chicken McNuggets on this list? Well, I think I should specifically say that because some kids have that as their entire diet. Okay, so we discuss all these at length in the full-day, eight-hour nutrition uh, seminar. Okay, yeah. Okay, so now very quickly I have... I have, oh great, I can do this. Uh, th very briefly, these are the supplements that, that, that are introduced into the child. Now, of course, you, especially if it's a little child, you know, he's two years old, you're going to introduce very small amounts of these. The capsules come apart, you mix them in juice. So, you know, just remember you're doing very tiny amounts of these. First one would be, Digestive enzymes has a twofold objective. On a full stomach with the food, it's drawn through the digestive tract, clears out the digestive tract. On an empty stomach, it's, it's designed just like alcohol and aspirin to go directly into the bloodstream and clear out any debris in the bloodstream. Second one is probiotics. Now there, 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 there again is autistic enterocolitis. Andy Wakefield has proven they all have dead colons. Their, their colon is an inhospitable environment in which for the vital probiotics of the infant's colon to form. The colon is the center of the immune system. Either you know that or you don't. Next one is expel. Again, the colon is blocked in the young, uh, in the autistic child. We must do the gentle, old-fashioned uh, chipping away by the herbal formula. Oral chelation. Now this you have to read the chapter, but this is specifically for the aluminum and mercury. The heavy metals contained in the vaccines actually crosses the blood-brain barrier and chelates, grabs these heavy metal ions and drags them out across tissue barriers they cannot escape by themselves. We are all mineral deficient in this country. Who's the guy who wrote Diet for a New America? Very good. And he says, oh, how, how did I turn that off? 
Uh, anyways, he says, you know, we have like 5% of the topsoil we had in 1900. So even if you're eating all organic fruits and vegetables at, say, uh, at, at, at Whole Foods, that doesn't matter. They weren't, they weren't necessarily grown in any uh, mineral-rich soil. And finally, hydrolyzed collagen. Whoa, three? Can I do that? A hydrolyzed collagen. So this, you know, I was trained. I was actually trained in, in the 90s. I, I encountered four of the top experts in the world on four of these subjects, and I, I apprenticed myself to them. I traveled with them. I studied with them. They taught me. And then these guys over the years, they either died or disappeared, but I, I knew their sources and I knew their formulas, so that's so I didn't I didn't make these things up. So that whole history is on my website as well. But here's here's something they taught me. They said supplementation. When it comes to supplementation, most supplement supplements are worthless because they are produced either directly or indirectly by whom? Pharmaceutical, Pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, 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 and. You should be taking, the person should be taking the least number of supplements possible, spending the least amount of money possible on supplements, but still thinking at the cellular level. The cellular, the, all the cells of the body must be able to do two things. Take in oxygen and nutrients and expel waste on a second by second basis. Okay, so that comes through clearing the blood and then clearing the tract for all the digestive issues that are clearly delineated in the chapters on the website. And, yeah. And then, does anybody know the handsome gentleman who invented the ultimate antioxidant in the late 90s? Very good, very good. Sedona, Arizona, a good friend of mine. You know, we, before he did that, pycnogenol was the ultimate. Grapeseed and pine bark. After he did that, you know, he went into that laboratory, Sedona, Arizona, for 12 years. And he was already child prodigy, child prodigy, biochemical genius, putting together the secret 43-step process of this. But I, I mean, I don't believe in this. I, I, I observe it. I do bioterrain analysis. I do live cell, you know, and you see somebody when, loaded with free radicals in the middle of chemotherapy or whatever, they're an alcoholic, the erythrocytes are all lumps and bumps. You see it, and you give them two of Flanagan's mega hydrate, and then you wait, third, and then, then you give them water, wait 30 minutes, and do a retest, and they're all normal. You know, that's neutralized free radicals, I mean. So why, why it's on this list is the act of any legitimate detox produces more free radicals. If you let them go, it's going to cause tissue damage. You must neutralize them with the best antioxidant there is. Shadow story. I already told that. I have 10 seconds. Are there any questions? Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Uh, please, please get on my uh, email list. Uh, there are a few books out there. I have to leave very soon. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.